So let's look at what the president said yesterday. President Trump attempting to walk back his statements from Helsinki, where he sided with the Russian state over the U.S. government and its intelligence services regarding Moscow's interference in the American political system. Take a look at what the president said standing next to Vladimir Putin and then his comments yesterday at the White House. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. I thought that I made myself very clear by having just reviewed the transcript. It should have been obvious. I thought it would be obvious, but I would like to clarify just in case it wasn't. In a key sentence in my remarks, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't or why it wouldn't be Russia. So just to repeat it, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. And the sentence should have been, and I thought it would be maybe a little bit unclear on the transcript or unclear on the actual video. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be Russia. Sort of a double negative. So you can put that in, and I think that probably clarifies things pretty good by itself. So I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. In full faith and support for America's intelligence agencies. I have a full faith in our intelligence agencies. Whoops, they just turned off the light. That must be the intelligence agencies. <laughs> I accept our intelligence community's conclusion that Russia's meddling in the 2016 election took place. Could be other people also. Uh, there's a lot of people out there. We'll get into that in just a moment, but quickly, the president just tweeted a moment ago this, quote, so many people at the higher ends of intelligence loved my press conference performance in Helsinki. Putin and I discussed many important subjects at our earlier meeting. We got along well, which truly bothered many haters who wanted to see a boxing match. Big results will come. And last night, the president tweeted this, the meeting between President Putin and myself was a great success except in the fake news media. Trump's comments yesterday came more than 24 hours after his news conference with Putin. He did not try to clarify his remarks in any of his post-summit tweets, nor did he back down during either of the two interviews he did with Fox News immediately after the summit. Meanwhile, a shot of the statement the president was reading shows that he wrote this, quote, there was no collusion. Meanwhile, NBC News had some reporting on how that all came to be and who pressured the president to step out and make that statement yesterday, including the vice president, the secretary of state. Um, Heidi, the, the president's statement yesterday that this was a, a misstatement, that it was a word problem, sort of ignores everything else that happened on the stage in that press conference. It ignores the fact that he didn't say anything about it for 24 hours, even as he saw the coverage of what was happening. If you believed what he said yesterday, that this was just a question of a misplaced word, kind of feel bad for you. Well, really, do you remember when we were in grade school and you messed up on a word and you took out the lumpy whiteout and you lumped it over? You can't do that here because it's not just one word. It was the entire context right. of what he said. It was the trashing of institutions. It was also saying that Putin had a great idea to potentially combine our investigation and have Bob Mueller go to Russia to give them information on what his investigation is all about. So I think anybody who watched the president's news conference, which was essentially the entire world, would know that you can't just hit delete on a single word and change the entire tone and context of that news conference. Eddie, he also was reading from that statement, sort of head down, reading prepared remarks. And in the moment he did ad lib, he said, yes, OK, it was Russia. They did meddle in the election. He looked up and said, it could be other people, a lot of people out there. He always has to always. sneak in that caveat, which in fact undermines what he said prior to it. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, uh, Eugene Robinson and, and Rich Stingle said, Rich Stingle said that it looked as if he was reading a hostage note, right, as opposed to actually apologizing. I like to use this analogy, you know, since President Trump is a golfer, instead of trying to get a mulligan, he just moved his ball in full view to a better lie, right? And so I, he's shameless. He doesn't seem in any, in, in, in any serious way, right, to try to take 
uh, account of what he actually did. And what I'm really interested in is the way in which Republican, fellow Republicans have just simply failed uh, to, to hold him mm. to account. Admiral Stavridis, uh, we're, we're talking about the rhetoric involved here and the change of tenses and uh, things like that and double negatives. And yet the reality is that these two men, Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, sat behind closed doors for two hours and discussed things that are potentially lethal to the future, not only of the European alliance and the United States-Soviet relationship, but that whole <clears throat> region, peace and missiles and the mismatch between the two men. Yeah, Mike, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about this contrast between President Obama and President Trump, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna rattle the ghost of another president, and that's President Reagan, because we're also talking about other audiences. Think about Europe and how this is being received there. And think back to Ronald Reagan standing at the Berlin Wall saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Instead, what we have today is a president who supposedly goes in a secret room, a little quiet room, with nobody there but a couple translators, and that's where he really tells Vladimir Putin, hey, your interference in our election was wrong. Are we really supposed to believe that? And by the way, I thought the worst moment of the press conference was actually when Vladimir Putin flipped the soccer ball to the president of the United States. It, it reminded me of the scene in Castaway where Tom Hanks starts talking to his volleyball. Now we've got Ivan the soccer ball in the White House. It's a bad day for the American presidency. So as Heidi mentioned, this wasn't about one line or one word. This was about the full context of the president's press conference with Vladimir Putin. To believe what the president said yesterday, you'd have to discount everything else he said during that news conference, from his withering attack on the Justice Department and the FBI for investigating his campaign's ties to Russia, to Putin's, quote, incredible offer to help with the investigation, to lashing out at those who'd suggested Russian meddling was in any way responsible for his victory, to a debunked conspiracy theory about the 2016 hacking of the DNC, and, of course, Hillary Clinton's 33,000 missing emails. I do feel that uh, we have both made some mistakes. I think that the, the probe is a disaster for our country. I think it's kept us apart. It's kept us separated. There was no collusion at all. Uh, everybody knows it. What he did is an incredible offer. He offered to have the people working on the case come and work with their investigators with respect to the 12 people. I think that's an incredible offer, okay? That was a clean campaign. I beat Hillary Clinton easily, and frankly, uh, we beat her. And I'm not even saying from the standpoint, we won that race. And it's a shame that there can even be a little bit of a cloud over it. Uh, people know that, people understand it, but the main thing, and we discussed this also, zero collusion. The Electoral College is much more advantageous for Democrats, as you know, than it is to Republicans. Uh, we won the Electoral College by a lot, 306 to 223, I believe. You have groups that are wondering why the FBI never took the server. Why haven't they taken the server? Where is the server? What is the server saying? I really do want to see the server. What happened to the server? So, Nick, obviously the president takes a question directly where he's presented with the opportunity to confront President Putin, who's standing five feet away from him, and turns it in to an old speech he's given many, many times about servers, about Hillary Clinton, about the Pakistani man who, with the server and everything else the president brings up. Um, did he do anything yesterday? to help himself with that clarification. Wait, real quick though, guys, let's just correct this. They have the server. They've had the <laughs> server forever. They just don't have the physical copy of it. They have an actual copy of it though, because we have more than floppy disks in the era of digital. Exactly, so what, what, what we saw yesterday in politics was called a walk back, right? The president managed to do a walk back or the walk back during the walk back. So it's not even clear what he was trying to say. He, he had to come back out and say, well, it could have been somebody else. And it was like watching a truculent kid in front of a blackboard at school being forced by his teachers to say something he didn't believe or want to say. There has really never been a performance, I think, in American politics that is like it. Uh, and you can only imagine why. He seems to have a particular personal interest here that is separate from the White House interest, 
but is dovetailing with Putin's interest on the investigation. It's fear. He, he and Putin are on the same page about the Russia probe. They both have an interest in stopping it and discrediting it. And that is a striking fact to me. And we've seen this rhythm before, Steve Ratner, where Charlottesville and other times where the president says something inflammatory, says something offensive. He's pushed into a corner, so he makes a, an apology that he reads from a piece of paper. And then the next day, which is today now in this story, he resents that he's not being rewarded and thanked for his great apology, and he lashes out again. Yeah, exactly. And I, look, I think there's several pieces to this. I think the most important piece is the one that Nick was referring to, which is ultimately our relationship with Russia and with Putin. And it's clear from everything he said and done that there's something going on between these two guys, which is not really in our national interests. And uh, the Wall Street Journal today had an editorial, which I think summarizes maybe, to your point, kind of where the... Uh, Republicans are, which was a sort of grudgingly accepted Trump's apology and with a lot of you know, sort of shrugs of the shoulder. And then they went on to list all the issues between us and Russia that are still unresolved about arms and, and uh, interference in other countries and things like that. So I, I don't think this changes anything about the fundamental issue of Trump's relationship with Putin, which is a scary, scary state of affairs. So Kristen Soltis Anderson, we'll get into some of the reporting on this, but Vanity Fair and Gabe Sherman reporting that Chief of Staff General John Kelly actually called around on Capitol Hill and gave the green light to Republican leadership to come out and publicly criticize the president, hoping to push President Trump into some kind of revision, into some kind of apology, into some kind of clarification. Pretty extraordinary for a Chief of Staff to do that. Well, I think this is different than other times that uh, President Trump has said things that have been inflammatory, that have been reckless. Uh, in part, you see it reflected in the number of Republicans that have come out and condemned it. This, to your, your point earlier, sort of reminds me a bit of the reaction to Charlottesville, where even many folks who tend to be pretty supportive of the president, you had folks like Newt Gingrich, um, a really big supporter of the president, coming out and saying, whoa, 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 he needs to clarify this. And I think it's because, for the most part, when the president does something reckless, he's criticized by Democrats, he's criticized by the media, he's criticized by a certain subset of Republicans that are very comfortable criticizing him. But if it doesn't go beyond that, Trump feels pretty confident that he can weather the storm. His job approval numbers don't move that much. I think the difference here is because you saw so many folks from Capitol Hill saying this is wrong, that's why you got to the, the hostage tape from yesterday, um, because this this is different. This is not just about being reckless, and it's not just about being offensive or saying something, misspeaking, not speaking like a politician. This is about weakness. And Donald Trump, a core brand attribute of his is, I am strong. I will be strong for America. Strong is not what we got in Helsinki. That's why you saw more Republicans bleeding off. And that is why, if that reporting is correct about the White House chief of staff, uh, th he was able, I believe, to feel he could go to the Hill and say, let, give me cover so that I can walk into the president's office and tell him you need to walk this back. And Eddie, in this case, it wasn't just the usual Republicans who are willing to be critical of President Trump, John McCain, Jeff mm -hmm. Flake, Bob Corker, and those. It was the leadership, which has been reluctant to criticize the president. The question is, was it a one-day criticism to get him to do what he did yesterday, and they can wash their hands of it and say, see, we were openly critical of the president on this, or will they follow on and make sure that Russia and the president are held to account when it comes to this story? Well, if our previous experience is any indication of what they're going to do. This is a one. It's a one-off. They're not going to do any do anything much after this, right? So I think it's important to, to understand that Republicans, they, after Charlottesville, they didn't want to be marked with racism. They didn't want to be seen as racist, and in this instance, they don't want to be seen as unpatriotic. So it makes sense that in both those two instances, that a number of Republicans would come out and be strong and have a visceral reaction to Trump's comments. But what will follow from that is very different, because as soon as Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader McConnell, in the first press conference, said something about Russia, he immediately pivoted to the judges, right? Lindsey Graham just said he missed opportunity. He didn't appreciate. So the, and then Marco Rubio, he clarified matters. But now we need to get to X, Y, and Z. They've, they're already pivoting. So I think, I think this is going to be business as usual. Heidi, you cover the Capitol pretty quickly, uh, pretty closely. Uh, Bob Corker yesterday, obviously he's on his way out of Washington, but said the dam is finally breaking, talking about the Trump presidency. And he said, thankfully. Mm -hmm. 
Is there any indication that that's actually true, or do you feel like Republicans have gotten on the record critical of the president on this issue and are now ready to move on? Don't look at me like that, Eddie. <laughs> so I think Eddie made an important point that there was a distinction between the responses, right? You saw some very strong responses by members like Senator John McCain, who said this is awful, it's, it's humiliating, uh, and then you saw the leadership. And the leadership simply said that they had confidence in U.S. intelligence agencies. I think we can all agree that is not a direct rebuke of the president. That said, I do think that there is definitely a heightened awareness and commitment on the Hill to try and make some measures and some movement on election security. We will see that in the House. We will see that in the Senate. I think what we should all keep our eyes on right now is the fact that in the House, there's right now an amendment to actually water down sanctions mm -hmm. on Russia. They're going to be going into a conference committee this week with the Senate. Keep your eye on that. That is a big deal that allows Russia to continue to sell military grade hardware to other countries, and they make a lot of money off of that. Hard to see how they could keep going with that in the context of everything that's happened this week. Everybody sit tight. Admiral Servetus, want to talk to you about some comments the president made about Article 5 of NATO last night in an interview with Fox and still ahead on more. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories, and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.